Hello, I'm Jordan Maxwell. The video you're about to watch is composed of three separate half an hour interviews that were conducted not too long ago. The lady that will be interviewing me is Rita Dyson. The man is Ralph Walker. Uh, the response to these three half hour interviews when they first aired was so favorable that we felt that we wanted to put them together into one program and we hope that you will enjoy them. And of course, we would be very happy to hear from you if you'd like to have some further, you know, further information. I want to thank you for your time. Of all the tyrannies that affect mankind, tyranny in religion is the worst. Every other species of tyranny is limited to the world we live in. A religion attempts to strive beyond the grave and seeks to pursue us into eternity. Thomas Paine. Jordan, you, you've got to tell me about yourself. Um... Well. Rita, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me back, and I enjoy being here with you. Uh, as I told you before and privately, the way I involve myself in this is it comes by me naturally because when my mother, when I was growing up as a little kid, my mother had an uncle who worked in the Vatican, Secretary of State's office. And about every three or four years, he'd come back to the country to visit the family. And as a little kid, I would sit and listen to this, uh, this brilliant, uh, gentleman talking about international intrigue, politics of the highest levels. And he was quite knowledgeable working in the Vatican Secretary of State's office. And the things he would talk about, the secret societies, the, uh, the money that was made throughout the world internationally, the politics, and generally the entire world scheme of things, how politics and religion work together behind the scenes. So I grew up hearing this kind of conversation, and my grandfather was a senator, and my great-grandfather was a congressman. I have two living uh, uncles today who are federal judges. Mm -hmm. So I grew up around uh, hearing this type of uh, conversation in the family about intrigue and politics and the behind-the-scenes stuff going on in world religion. At the ripe old age of 17, I decided that I wanted to find out if there was a bottom to this issue. And I began my research and study into theology and all of the uh, arcane or occult uh, theologies of the world. I was fascinated by um, some of the most powerful movements in the world. And uh, I have come to the conclusion that there has never been on this earth a political movement that wasn't a little religious. Mm. And there's never been a religious movement in the history of the world that wasn't a little political. Mm -hmm. But the problem you run into with theology, and when you get into religion and theology, is that there are two kinds of facts that we have in theology. The kind you look up and the kind you make up. And so much of what we have been uh, told uh, and be left to believe is true in theology and religion, especially in the Western world is nothing more, in my opinion, than political propaganda. Mm -hmm. And I think this can be proven, but over and above the political aspect of Western religion, I am also fascinated, as this book brings out, it's just a general anthology on religion, just generally things which most people don't know about theology and religion that mm -hmm. the church would rather you not know. Uh, for instance, uh, we get into, I get into in particular, the, uh, the connection between theology, which is the world's oldest religion. Mm -hmm. You can go back to five to 7,000 years before Christ, and the worship of the heavens what dominated the ancient world. I, as I said, I don't believe that there are, there are too many people today in the Western civilization who have really looked at where religion came from, where our ideas and concepts have come from. Now, we don't mind, uh, we are all aware 
of how other people can be wrong in what they believe. Because other people, uh, we have a theology, and other people have a mythology. Other people are wrong because they don't have, they don't share your concepts and your belief, and that's because they don't understand. They're wrong, but they don't understand. Uh, I am saying that we can all be wrong. There's not one human creature on the earth that, that is so well informed that they cannot possibly be wrong on something. All I'm asking my audience to do is to look at the facts of where Western religion has come from and look at behind the scenes uh, the connections between government and religion. Let me give you an example. Okay, but even... All right. Well, let me give you a quick example okay. of just the point I made between uh, tying government in with religion. When you go into most churches today, you will see the altar is three tiers high. It's three degrees high. It has, uh, in most churches, they will have a, a fence with the gate, and only the priest can go through the gate or through the fence uh, up until the altar. When the priest, uh, the clergy, comes out, he's dressed in a long robe. Everyone stands out of respect. It's the same thing in any courtroom. You have the people of the, of, the, uh, of the congregation out here. You have the fence with the gate, and only the attorneys can go through and speak for you. And the bench is three tiers high. The three tiers high in the church and courtroom stand for the first three degrees of Freemasonry. The, when, the, when, the, uh, when the judge comes out, he's dressed in a long black robe, just as the priest is dressed in a long black robe just as you will be dressed in a long robe when you graduate from university or, or college. Um, the, the connections are continual. The, the judge can sit and look down on you, for he represents the law, spelled L-A-W. Mm -hmm. You need to look at where the word law comes from. And then, of course, the, the priest can look down on the audience and the people in the church. He represents God, which is the law. So you're saying that... Um people should start looking at things with a more with a different eye yes, yes. than what they in other words people just take it for granted this has always been and this is the way it oh, is absolutely. but there is there is an origin for, for every one of these things Gerald Massey one of the greatest Egyptologists that ever lived wrote that they will find it difficult those who have accepted the authority as truth rather than the truth as authority. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying that that's what's happened to us as a civilization in the West. I'm not interested that much in the East tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more interested in our Western way of life and the religion, the philosophies that guide our lives, the mere fact that in this country, in America, when you run afoul of the law, they say you have broke the law, mm -hmm. just as Moses broke the law the law. Mm -hmm. And of course the sheriff has a six-pointed badge as the star, the star of David or the six-pointed hexagram. Mm -hmm. uh, all of our judicial proceedings in court are based on the old common, uh, common law of England or Britannia. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, Britain is Britain or Brit-ish. Mm -hmm. And Brit in Hebrew is a contract or a covenant. And the word ish means man or men. Therefore, the word British is the covenant men, or men of the covenant. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, but, it's a fascinating story when we understand that our government is based on religion, and we didn't even know it. And I'm saying, wake up. To do your homework. Okay. You, they, you have s such vast, such a, you know, a vast amount of information that I have to try and hold you back a minute because I want to get into okay. more things. Okay. I want to say some things here. Okay. For one thing, first, let me let me say this. How would you classify yourself? I mean, are you are you religious or are you spiritual? Are you uh, what somebody would say agnostic? I mean, what, what what are you? I'm a common man, an ordinary man, in the pursuit of an extraordinary subject. I consider myself to be one who appreciates and will fight for truth. You are a truth seeker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the, the best way to term it. I am an extremely spiritual person in that I hold very, very high spiritual um, morals, ethics. 
I believe in a very powerful spiritual force that dominates and overshadows the world. Uh, Christians call it God. Uh, others may call it something else. But I have a very high respect for spirituality. I have no time mm -hmm. for religion as such. Anything that is organized by man uh, quite certainly is not touching God. I think that we have a direct connection with our Creator, with that great spiritual God force in the universe. We don't need another man to intervene for us. Okay, so then would you say that, um, let's say somebody might say, well, how dare you question the Bible? I mean, how dare you write a book like this? You must be a demon or something. Mm -hmm. how, how would you answer that? I would say the same thing has been said of Solomon Rushdie. How dare you question the Quran? How dare you question uh, the Karl Marx in the in the Communist Manifesto or Mao and the Little Red Book of Mao? How dare you question authority? I'm saying that the man that we read about in the New Testament, the one called Jesus, if he taught us nothing, it was to question authority. Because any time you give away your spirituality and your authority, and you do it yourself, you know, no one comes and, hurt and, and puts your hand behind your back and forces you to give up your spirituality and your individual freedom and your right to be a human being and decide for yourself. You do that yourself. And when you do that and you give up your sovereignty to the government, to the church, to a religion, to a book, to a concept, to anything, you are enslaving yourself. All I'm asking the public to do is do a little research. See if what I'm saying is wrong and, and, and judge for yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm not advocating. I'm not running for a po political position. I'm not trying to start my own church. Mm -hmm. What I would like to see done as a, as a spiritual revolution in this country where people say, just say no. Just say no to organized religion. Just say no to organized government. Just say no to tyranny. I don't care where it is and what color it is. Bigotry, ignorance, ill-informed stupidity. Just say no from here on out. But if the point I'm making is that you need to do your homework. You need to study and find out where things came but what from. what happens? What happens when they do find out? What happens to those who, who their whole life has been the Bible? There's so many people who have, you know, the Bible is what ask, keeps them going every day. What will, what will they have to replace it? Ask the Russians in the Russia today. Ask the Russians in Russia today, what is it like when you find out that you've been hoodwinked, that your government was not the most powerful, the most wonderful government on earth, and now it has totally collapsed. Now what are you going to do? You trusted, you brought up your children, you wasted your entire life and you went along to get along. And now what happens? Your whole world is collapsing around you. And why? Because you didn't do your homework and you didn't stand up for what was right when you could have. You went along to get along so because it was comfortable at the time and now it's very uncomfortable. And I'm saying that okay. that's what we all have to do is look at the uncomfortable facts that nothing is permanently on this earth. That do nothing is permanently on this earth. No. Let's see. They have here um, Bible model, Bible models, Bible morality. They have here um, who was Jehovah, and this is Thomas Thomas Jefferson who wrote mm -hmm. this. Who was Jehovah? A being of terrific character, cruel, vindictive, capricious, and unjust. Then also, who was Abraham? An insane barbarian patriot who married his sister, denied his wife. Who was Jacob, another patriarch, who won God's love by deceiving his father, cheating his uncle, robbing his brother? This is Bible morality. Now, understand, I didn't write that. Other okay. authors are in the book. Okay. But the point I wish to make, one does not need to even read the book. Okay. One can all, all just read the Bible and read and put flesh on the things which happen in the Bible. Well, this thing, Think about this it. is in the Bible. Of so course it this is. This is in the Bible. Are you aware that there were 15? Now, let me ask you something. Are you aware that there were 15 other major religions? This is history now. Okay. Not conjecture, history. There were 15 major theological religions, religious movements in the world before Christianity 
that taught exactly the same identical story of a Messiah who came to the earth, who was born in a manger, who died on a cross, who had 12 apostles, who died with a crown of thorns. Are you aware that there were 15 major religions that had the same identical teachings of Christianity? Most people aren't. And I'm very suspect of a 16th religion which is copied off of 15 previous religions and I am told that this one is the truth. I become very suspect. That is, that's the way I am as a teacher and as a researcher and a writer. I become rather suspect and I tell you something else I'm very suspect and that is the connection between government and politics today in America. I think both should be investigated and that's what this book attempts to do. Look behind the scenes of both our authorities in the world, religion, politics and money. So when that happens, people will actually have almost a renaissance of themselves. Let us hope so. And a whole new type of uh, person can I come about. I think you will agree that that's what we need. Our country is in trouble. Our families are in trouble. Our whole human race is in trouble. And basically we can boil it down to three problems we all share on this earth in common. Religion, politics, and money. And I'm telling you, the three are not separate, they are all one. Because in the ancient world, the king always represented not only temporal power, but also heavenly power. He was the connection between the people and God. That is why today we have a... a you cannot get married in this country today in America. There is a, we are told that there is a division between church and state. No such division exists. If you want to start a church, you must get a 501c3 uh, permit from the government. You must get permits. You must pay the fees. You must do all of these legal things with the red tape of government before you can set up a church. Now, once you've set up the church with all the government's permission and permits, you cannot get married in this country unless you have a marriage license first. Then you can go to the minister and be married. And if your marriage doesn't work out, you don't go to God. You go to a judge in the courtroom. I'm telling you there's something going on here between religion and politics and it's money, it's power. And until such time as we're willing to, to look at what's been going on in this country for over 200 years and be open-minded because your brain, your mind is like a parachute. It don't work if it's not open. I'm telling you, we, we can be exploited if we're not willing to open our minds, open our hearts and say let's look at the facts. Because the fact is, all over the world, people are being led by religious leaders. Ayatollah Khomeini and Saddam Hussein are just two of uh, many people. And in this country, we, we put things on the back of our okay. car, support our troops in the Middle East. You don't even know what they were doing in the Middle East. Do you think religion that has something to do? Religion and politics. Okay, religion and politics. Do you think that has something to do with this, what we call this new world order, this global um, uh, unification? That you can bet on. You do? I think that I can make a very good case of that in a court of law if given an opportunity. If you look at the symbols on the back of the one dollar bill, the pyramid on the back of the one dollar bill, above the pyramid on the back of a one dollar bill, look at it, you'll see an Anuit Coeptus. Anuit Coeptus in Latin means our enterprise is now a success or our project is now a success. Look at the wording of the, on the banner beneath the pyramid, Novas Ordo Seclorum. Novas Ordo Seclorum is new order of the world, the new world order. Mm -hmm. Why is an Egyptian pyramid on an American dollar bill? Are you aware of the symbolism going on here? Like the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C.? You know what the Washington Monument stands for? It stands for the male erection. And it connects right down the waters of life to the Oval Office. The Oval is the female, the Washington Monument is the male. It has to do with religion, it has to do with sex, it has to do with political power. And we take these instruments and we take these symbols and we think they're so marvelous, do your homework and you'll find out that so much of what we consider to be holy and righteous is in fact nothing more than sex, religion, and money. And most people pretty well know that. But no one has actually bothered to confront the establishment. I hope to do that. I want to confront the establishment for the one reason I think that the truth is an idea whose time has come. 
I think we've all been manipulated and exploited, and it's time we look at the real truth. Yes, well, I think that a lot of people are somewhat um, walking around in a daze. Oh, so many things are happening; they don't they don't know where to turn. Absolutely. And they they I think that many of them um, they don't really feel very happy with what they receiving in church when they do go to church. You Absolutely. know, they feel something is wrong. It's because something is wrong. It's not true. The things which we have been told are not true. You can prove this in any good library. All one has to do is mm -hmm. do something you've never done before. Mm -hmm. Go to a library and spend all day reading theology. And you will find the world has known for thousands of years that these stories are nothing more than stories. Now, um... As a matter of fact, Rita, the Bible is called the greatest story ever told. The greatest story, not the greatest collection of facts, not the most paramount uh, uh, document on earth, the greatest story ever told. It's a story. Mm. One must know how to read the symbols and the emblems and the terms. And that is why... The symbols in the, in the, the Bible, too? The symbols are in the Bible everywhere. I mean, did you know, for instance, that the book of Revelation was not written by Christians? The book of Revelation was around for at least five hundred years before Christianity ever came into existence. The book of Revelation was already in circulation. No John ever wrote the book of Revelation. His name was Ion, I-O-N, from the Ionian Sea. And when in, in, in Latin, when you change I's to J, it becomes J-O-N. Mm. But in the English, it becomes J-O-H-N. So the t today we're told that John wrote the book of Revelation. No such John ever wrote the book of Revelation. It was mm. written 500 years before Christ was ever born. Oh, this is just, just, it's just, you know, it's earth-shaking. Wait till the real truth comes out about religion and politics in America, and you're going to see the earth shake. Are you ready for the tomatoes? Are you ready to I've dock? already gotten it many times. Okay. <laughs> now... In the book, um, the book your church doesn't want you to read, you have an article, Astrotheology. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? And I co-edited the book with, with Tim Leadham. He was our editor. Tim Leadham okay. is the editor of the book. And I helped him co-edit it, right. but I also uh, did a chapter on Astrotheology. Astrotheology. And, uh, and I wanted to say also Steve Allen. Yeah. Also wrote Steve Allen is a in very brilliant too. writer, and he right. is a part of our book. Now, um... You, you have now, we, we opened up the show with uh, Thomas Paine, mm -hmm. discussion by him. But you also, you must like Thomas Paine because yeah, you I also think have a, him on here. Yeah, absolutely incredible okay. man. Okay, he wrote, um, the Christian religion is a parody on the worship of the sun in which they put a man whom they call Christ in the place of the sun and pay him the same adoration which was originally paid to the sun. Why did you select Thomas Paine? And tell me more about this astrotheology. Well, because that is a classic comment about astrotheology. Astrotheology is the basis for all religion in the world, period. Astro, what does that astro astro mean? Astrotheology. Theology is the worship of a religion, okay. theology. And astro is the heavens, the worship of the heavens. From as far back in history as we can go, man has always worshipped the heavens. That's why we're even told in Western civilization that when you die, you'll go to heaven. Mm. And that, of course, the, the, the interesting point that Thomas Paine was making is the same one that I continue to make, that uh, the whole concept of the sun, S-O-N, God's son, goes directly back to the old uh, concept of God's son, S-U-N, being the risen savior, because the sun is the risen savior it, it, it does rise and of course god's son s-u-n uh the egyptians said had an evil brother he was the prince of darkness and he came out at night to rule the world when god's son died and went away the world was in the hands of the prince of darkness and his name was set and he came out at sunset mm. okay uh today uh, even the, the Egyptians, the Egyptians said that that newborn son that came up every morning, his name was Horus, and they would come out in the temples of Karnak and the temple at Thebes and, and uh, Heliopolis, Egypt, 
And when the sun would come up in the morning, as they still do in the Islamic faith, they would meet in the morning to greet the coming of the new sun. We do it in, in, in Easter. We have Easter sunrise services. Mm -hmm. Yes. Horizon. Uh, hor Horus Horizon. Uh -huh. That's where we get the word horizon. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that there are 15 major religions in the world before Christianity that have taught the same thing. It is a very ancient, old story. That's why the Bible is called the greatest story ever told. So, now, what and I'm not saying there's not good spirituality in the Bible. I am saying that it has been twisted and used by political powers for a political agenda to keep us ignorant, ill-informed, and unread, do you, de you, depending on the Lord to come back to help us, when in fact there is no Lord coming back to help us education knowledge and your own personal spirituality and investigation of what the story is really about do your homework that's the only salvation we have left um well, well there's a few questions i wanted to ask you but okay um uh, what about there's no adam and eve no or the Christ, word the, no Christ? adam comes from the word adam no that's why the the uh, hebrews do not have do not take part in christianity uh, the Jews do not accept Jesus as the Messiah and many many Christians Jumping to conclusions say well the Jews don't accept Jesus. That's because they hated the Messiah. No, no such thing is true yeah. The reason why Jews do not accept Christianity is really rather simple yeah. They know the story and they know it's just the story It's the uh, Gentiles that don't know this what we need to do is wake up and find out that this is a story. What is the story telling us? Now, um, in our last discussion, you were saying that the, uh, the government, which says about separation of church and state, mm -hmm. but that that is not true. I don't believe that. The government true. is very much involved with, with religion. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, if you'll go back to the very beginnings of mankind, there's always been this uh, coexistence between government and religion, between church and state. And of course, in all the ancient empires, the king also was the mediator between God and man. So he wasn't just the king of the state, he was also the mediator between his people and God. Uh, up until the time of the French Revolution, that was always the case even in Europe uh, with the papacy. Uh, today, of course, we in America like to believe that we have a division between church and state. But it is my proposition and my idea that, there, that no such division exists. That the church as we know it today in Western civilization is in fact nothing more than a tool and a counterpart to government. It is that like two hands, government and religion, both helping the one mind to, to do its work. And so that's what I am intending to do, is to enlighten people as to where government ideas, concepts, and belief systems have come from, and theology and religion, and where those ideas have come from, and show the connections behind the scenes of how we, because we're unread in the field, are being manipulated and exploited by government and religion. And I think it's an idea whose time has come. And you asked me before what kind of a reception I get. I get a very powerful uh, positive response when I was in New York on ABC New York with Bob Grant uh, I was supposed to do a half-hour interview I ended up doing a two-hour interview mm -hmm. the response was overwhelmingly positive many people in our country know instinctively that there's something going on in big government big business big money and big religion and everyone seems to know that but no one has uh, as of yet gone into and brought out all of the facts surrounding religion and government in our country and the monetary and the money connection. Okay, now, That's what I'm trying to do. Yes. Now, wouldn't you say that, um, that that allows, in other words, if you, if, if people begin to see what you're saying and, I mean, our government, it's, it, the guidelines, it's, it's based upon, the moral guidelines is based upon religion, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Now, if you take away the religion, what will happen to the moral guidelines? 
Well, I, I'm you won't not trying, have any. You see, I, now, I'm making the distinction here. I'm not talking about spirituality. I am a very highly spiritual person. I believe in a divine overshadowing in the universe. I you believe, do believe in the absolutely, divine. Absolutely. In a divine uh, God or creator. I totally am convinced that there is a divine essence to us. And, uh, and uh, so I have no problem with spirituality. What makes you convinced? I'm, well, I'm talking about organized religion. No, no, but what makes you convinced about that the, we do have a divine Oh, I think that there are far too many things that happen to all human beings that we know that there's more to life than just us. Okay. I think that we've all had too many uh, experiences. Every one of us have had experiences, uh, some even more so than others. Right. But uh, to prove that there is some sort of a spiritual or a spiritual dynamics to our life. Uh, I myself have had many experiences in a spiritual way to convince me that I am not here on this earth by myself, uh, that there are spirits here. I believe in a God or a creator. So I have no problem, as I said, okay. with spirituality. I have a very big problem with government, money, and religion. Yes, that's some, my... somewhat contaminates the, oh. the, the, the beauty of the, the divine essence Absolutely. that is there. No doubt about it. And they, uh, mm -hmm. we have the best politicians and religious leaders that money can buy. And I'm tired of that. So okay, that's can I just ask you something? Do. Kind of thrown off a little bit. Um, do you believe in reincarnation? And what, what does the Bible say about that? And well, I believe that, the, I think that you can make a good case for this, that in the Bible and the Old Testament and the New, uh, I believe that there was much in the Old and New Testament uh, to support uh, reincarnation but was dropped out and taken out during the Middle Ages because we know that happened we know many scriptures were, were uh, deleted and some things were put in that were not in the original mm -hmm. so I think that the uh, the scriptures dealing in both in the Old and New Testament with reincarnation were taken out purposely mm -hmm. because the church felt that that would be uh, harmful to the people to think that they come back and they come back again because if you keep coming back before God and, and other lifetimes, then why do you need to contribute to the church today? Why do you, absolutely, why do you even need to go to church today or to even hear the priest if you're going to come back the next time and do it over again anyway? So I think the church said no, none of this. We have to take that out and let, let everyone believe that they only have one time through and that's it. So you have to be in subjection to religion. Oh, so that right there right. shows the government being involved with the well, I mean, uh, uh, even in uh, uh, European history, it's, uh, our history of Europe is filled with the papacy and the Pope of Rome being involved with the kings and the princes of uh, Europe. And, of course, that's referred to as the old order of the world, the old world order. And, of course, in America, we have our religio-political foundations, and we call ourselves a new world order. Mm -hmm. and that's on the dollar bill, the back of the dollar bill. So there's a lot of... Uh, connections behind the scenes between major religion, big money, and government. Mm -hmm. And that's what the book is about. The book your church does not want you to read. It's just a general anthology on all of the things that are in religion that the churches don't want you to know about. Now, um, as we explore this, what happens to people as they become more enlightened? What else will, I mean, I cannot believe, I can't think of, of people not ever having a church in their life. Um, church seems to mean so much, give so much more. I mean, how would the church be completely changed? Would we ever have a church again? <clears throat> well, I mean, w did they have churches in, in Adam and Eve's day? I mean, when, when creation first began and the ancient peoples of the ancient world, did they have churches? You see, I'm saying that there's a very big difference between religion, which requires a church and the clergy and money and organization, as opposed to spirituality within your individual self, spiritually between you and your divine creator. I don't believe that there is necessity for a church, synagogue, or whatever. I think that uh, the spirituality is between you and your creator. So I, I don't I see kinda, a need for the church. Yes, I think I kind of pick up what you're saying, is that you want to bring back the essence and the innocence of people. Yes. And not have, have it all of this um, 
Yeah, accoutrements of entertainment, like entertainment tonight. Entertainment. Right. Right. And, and so uh, I see nothing uh -huh. spiritual in, in, uh, in the church television and church radio. I see nothing more than the Madison Avenue promotion mm -hmm. of religion that mm -hmm. always and in every way supports government. That would be a major uh, metamorphosis for people yes. if, if that was to ever happen. I think that's going to happen. I think that we are being forced uh, by events in the world to wake up and, and begin to question our foundations and our belief systems. Uh, we expect the Arabs to do so. We expect uh, the, uh, the Hindus to examine their foundations and see that, that they are, uh, need to examine what they believe. And it's very good for everyone else in the world to examine what they believe. So, uh, why isn't it good for us to do the same? So now that um, Freemasonry, is that the one, is that where symbolism started coming well, yes. about? Well, I mean, let me explain why I got into symbolism. As you said in the beginning of the program, my, my mother had an uncle who worked in the Vatican's Secretary of State's office. Mm -hmm. And uh, every few years he would come back to this country and he would sit and talk for days about all the intrigue going on behind the scenes of religion and politics. And it was very interesting conversation because, uh, and I was just a small child growing up, but I would hear him and I would hear this kind of conversation where he would deal with symbols and emblems and secret societies and fraternal orders and the wars and do revolutions. Do you have that to show us? Any uh, symbols? Well, we, we don't have that with us tonight, but we do have uh, a few slides that we'll get into in a few minutes. Uh, dealing with the foundations of Western religion. But uh, in relation to the symbols, all of these emblems and symbols mean something to us, you know, and, and so many people are unaware. I mean, the Bible has Jesus saying, many will look with their eyes but not see. And that is certainly true. People look at symbols all day long and have no idea in the world what they mean. And symbols are very important. And if you don't think so, watch someone wearing a swastika go into a synagogue and watch the reaction that the Jews will have when they see the swastika. Because symbols mean something. They have very I powerful I've sports. often wondered about the swastika. It's, it, isn't it like a cross? Well, it's the Hindu originally. The swastika from Germany was a Hindu symbol. Um, and, and, of course, then it... it it generated down into finally the Nazis picked it up like many other nations and other mm -hmm. people picked it up too. The American Indians had, and the Buddhists have the uh, swastika. Are we going to go to the slides? I, I think yes, yeah, if you'd like. like, we can go to the slides. I was just oh, going to, to. Um, I'm just going to make mention about the foundations of Western religion. Well, maybe we can idea. do that on part uh, the, the the next show. We can. Well, let's go on with this since, since we've already uh, introduced the um, the idea of Western religion. Um, of course, we know that the Western religion is based on a far older uh, Bible, the Bible of the Old Testament. Uh -huh. uh, even further back, if you'll go back into the most ancient history of the world, in the Middle East especially, you will see, as we will show you now, the, uh, the volcano was one of the many uh, things that were worshipped in the ancient world. The volcano was very important because it represented a life and creation, and it had a sexual connotation. Wow. Uh, that's why today in most uh, men's rooms and hotels and restaurants, there will always be a triangle on the door. Uh, triangle being the, oh. the pyramid. Pyramid comes from the word pyra, meaning fire, and mid, meaning middle. Right. The fire of sexual generation is in the middle of the human body. That's why the volcano always represented sex, uh, the coming of life and the fire of life that brings new life to the world. Mm -hmm. So the volcano was a very important symbol to the ancient people. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go to the next slide and we will see how, now here is the encyclopedia discussion of, and let's go to, we'll see it says the volcano, like any other uh, impressive or fearful aspect of nature, the volcano had become the objects of worship for human beings from the earliest Stone Age. Yet the original Yahweh, which is one of the gods of the Old Testament, the original Yahweh seems to have begun as a volcano god also. Mount Sinai, where Moses encountered him, as was the seat of the Midianite god, uh, and in the Midianites' earliest homeland, he was identified with the local moon god Sin which is where we get the name for the mountain in, uh, in the Middle East, Sinai or Sinai. 
comes from the old moon god Sin, uh, after whom the mountain was named. The appearance of Yahweh, as I said, Yahweh is one of the old, uh, one of the ancient gods of the Old Testament. And the reference work says, the appearance of Yahweh as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So that's the way the Old Testament God, Yahweh, appeared. And that was found in Exodus 13, 21 and 22. Now the word volcano, and this is important now, the word volcano, and let's go back to it, here it is. The word volcano comes from the Latin volcano god Vulcan, or Vulcanus, derived from the old Christian deity Vulcanus. I want to repeat that. This is the most important. That the word, let's go back to the slide because I want to show that. That the word volcano comes from the Latin volcano god Vulcan. Okay, let's take the next slide. Now we're talking about the old volcano god. Let's go to the next one. Now here we have uh, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. We see the Israelites in the, uh, in the desert, and there's the God uh, representation. And uh, we'll go to the next slide now and see that uh, in the middle, we're, here's a reference work on Job 38. Now on the reference work of Job 38, it says thunder is called in Hebrew kolath, or voices, for it is considered the voice of God. So here we have thunder, which is called in Hebrew, koloth, or voices, for it is considered the voice of God. Let's go to the next one. Uh, okay, there it is again. We're just saying the thunder is voices. It's considered the voice of God. Next one. Now, here in Job 38, we will go to the top uh, one first. In Job 38, 1, in the footnote, it talks about the storm. It says, the storm, the clouds, are God's tent. Uh, gather, and let's see, it's gathered as the thunder, the voice of Yahweh. Now, if you can zoom in on that a little bit, we can see that clearer right there. So we see that God's tent are gathered as the thunder, which is the voice of Yahweh, roars. They descend and God shoots his arrows of his lightning. So we're talking about Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, uh, with his thunder and his arrows of lightning. And then uh, beneath it, we'll see on the bottom, in Hebrew, it says, God thunders wonderfully. We can see the bottom line, can we? God thunders wonderfully. Can we see the bottom line? Yes. God thunders wonderfully with his voice. Okay, let's go on. <clears throat> so now we see that thunder and lightning is connected to the old volcano God, the God of the volcano. The next slide. Here we have, and we can zoom in on the a little bit on the bottom, we can see that at Mount Sinai, Jehovah performed signs, the mountain trembled and smoked all over. Millions now heard and proof that uh, what Moses had been made known in God's name was actually the word of God. Now, if we we'll back off, you can see that the Israelites are at Mount Sinai, and if you'll back off, you'll see that that is uh, Mount Sinai is pictured here in the uh, biblical text as a volcano. The next slide. Now here we have Jehovah. Let's go in and get that a little bit closer. So we can see that Jehovah led the sons of Israel to the mountain named Sinai, and there he gave them his law. Now look at the mountain, and you will see the mountain at Sinai, where uh, the Israelites encounter Yahweh, Jehovah, is actually the volcano. Now let's go again to the next one. Okay, now there we have the, uh, in the, in the uh, reference work of the Hebrew holidays, we have Rosh Hashanah and uh, Yom Kippur, and the next slide, the next one we will see is uh, another set of holidays with the Passover, and um, now on the bottom, we will see that, uh, let's bring it in and a little bit closer on the bottom, and we'll see one of the holidays is the feast of the giving of the law. So here's when Moses was given the law from uh, Mount Sinai. Now let's go to the next slide, and I think we'll have a better picture of that. Okay, we'll back up a little bit. There it is. Now we're seeing that this is the feast of the giving of the law, which coincides with the feast of the first fruits. Let's go to the next picture, which will bring that picture up a little closer, I think. And there we see the uh, volcano again at Mount Sinai. So we're seeing that 
Yahweh, the uh, one of the one of the different gods, one of the many gods of the Old Testament, is pictured here as the uh, volcano god. All right, now we go to part two, which is the closing part of this uh, section of. Uh, let's go to the next slide. We will see here now the. Um, let's see. Okay, now you'll see here on the Torah and the um, you'll see the benediction symbol. Now let's go on. Let's go to the next one. This is the rabbinical benediction symbol. That's the blessing. The blessing symbol that the uh, that the rabbis bless the congregation. Next one. Okay. Now we see the uh, the high priest of Israel blessing, and you'll see the hands raised in the priestly blessing for Yahweh, the volcano god or Vulcan. Okay. We'll go to the next picture there again uh, in the synagogue in Los Angeles. Let's go to the next picture. I think we've got a better one. And you will see, there we go, we have the, uh, the, uh, the prophet giving the benediction symbol. One more now. Let's go to the next one. All right, there is the, uh, move in on that if we can a little bit, and you'll see the hands a bit. The Pentateuch scroll crown with hands raised in the priestly blessing. So we see this is a priestly blessing in the Hebrew. All right, and that will go on one more. Let's go to the next one. Here is the rabbi giving the priestly blessing uh, for Yahweh at the synagogue. And one more, which is the last picture, will be explaining why Mr. Spock gives the priestly blessing. Uh, the next picture, uh, the priestly blessing, and that's why Mr. Spock is called a Vulcan. That was the whole idea of the Vulcan comes from Vulcanus, or the old Cretan deity which was later to be found in the Old Testament under the name of Yahweh. And that ends the uh, slide presentation. So the point I'm making is that when we find the foundations for our religious movements in America and in Europe, and then we find that from those foundations of the religious movements, we have our political movements. And so therefore, uh, what we need to do is understand that our religions and our politics are both one and the same, and if we're under the law and, and have to uh, be a nation under law, uh, the law is, of course, the law from the old volcano, Cretan volcano god, Vulcanus, the Vulcan. So I'm saying, uh, there, as I said, there are two kinds of facts in theology. There's the kind you look up and the kind you make up. And I'm, all I'm saying is that there's been a lot of theology that has been given to us, but people need to do their homework because so much that we've been given, which is holy, comes to find out when you do your homework is not that holy. Can I ask you one more thing? Um, yes. <clears throat> okay, we know all of the symbols and so forth. What about this thing that we, and I'm going to ask you something that a, a viewer may ask. Mm -hmm. What about the nor and the, and the curse of Can Canaan? Yes, well it was actually the curse of Canaan uh, supposedly explains where the black man comes from because he was cursed by God. Um, that is uh, that is a horrible misuse of scripture uh, and I think it's too much of a subject to get into now. Suffice it to say that it was purposely used by people who knew better when they were using it, uh, that it was not a curse on the black man that has to do with Cana and the Canaanites and the curse of the Canaanites. Canaanites were, were not black people. Black people were Africans, not Canaanites. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we can dispense with that. It was misused scripture. Mm -hmm. um, Is that something that we could have another topic on? Yeah, that would be another a very subject? interesting one. When you get into Cana and Babylon and how today the Babylonian Empire still rules in our world today. Our symbols and our emblems come directly from Cana and Babylon. So if there's a curse and, and they, on Cana, we're enjoying it right now. Okay, so that's something we can come back and talk yeah, about. I'd like to do that, On, yes. on that. Um, okay, all right, so now you don't feel that this is going to, when you take, I don't think, take this I don't away think, from people. No, I, mean, I think any time, I think it is a privilege to educate and help people to understand where What's going come from. on? Yeah. Okay. I am absolutely enthralled, and I mean, I'm, you know, I feel it's such a treat that you have come to be with us and to share this information with us. The, the secret societies is a very profound subject, and it's 
one that w most people just have never even looked at very closely. Uh, for something that is so powerful and so important in our day, the societies which control our country from behind the scenes, it's, uh, it's really important for us to understand how they got here and uh, the symbols which are used. Symbols, occult symbols, are like uh, letters of the alphabet. Put them together and they tell a story. But if you can't read the symbols, you don't understand the story. Okay. And so a classic example I'd like to bring to your audience's attention is like on the dollar bill. On the back of the one dollar bill, everyone uh, has a one dollar bill in their pocket, but very few people have ever looked at the symbolism on the back of a one dollar bill. Uh, there's much talk going on today in Washington about a new world order. If we look at the back of the dollar bill, the one dollar bill, on the left-hand side you'll see the magic circle, and within that magic circle is the pyramid with the all-seeing eye uh, separated from the body of the pyramid. And above the top of the pyramid, uh, the, uh, just above the eye, you have Anuit Coeptus, which is Latin for Anuit means our enterprise or our project. Coeptus uh, basically means has been crowned with success or is now a success. Therefore, our new Coeptus is our enterprise is now a success. Now, what was that enterprise? Not That's to right. You. Now, the enterprise itself is beneath the pyramid. Novas Ordo Seclorium. Novas is, uh, is all Latin. Novas is for new. Ordo is order, and seclorium is for the secular. Secular is like your secular job, your secular education, which means worldly, or your, the secular world. Therefore, novas ordo seclorium is new world order. A term that we hear quite frequently today. Exactly. Now, the interesting thing about this symbol of the new world order, why is it pictured beneath an Egyptian pyramid? Pyramids are in Egypt. And so there's a reason why Egypt has played such a very big part in America. America is, to the secret societies of the world, America is referred to as the new Egypt. And therefore, our symbols are from Egypt. Like in Washington, D.C., you have the obelisk in front of the White mm -hmm. House. The obelisk is Cleopatra's needle. Known as Washington Monument. The Washington Monument is nothing more than the Egyptian uh, Cleopatra's needle. The, uh, as a matter of fact, if you fly over Washington, D.C. and look down and you have uh, pictures in libraries of uh, Washington, D.C. from the air, you will see that it is laid out in a tremendous pyramid with the Capitol building in the triangle at the top. Uh, there's the long waterway, which is the River Styx, which is out in front of the Cleopatra's Needle. And, of course, at the end is the Magic Circle the Masonic Circle. So it all has to do with ancient occult secret societies, fraternal orders, and their symbolism. Now, a question that some viewers may be wondering, why the writing, why is it in Latin and not in uh, some African language? Well, why be Latin? Because, that's a very good observation, because it is African symbolism, but Latin language, because the... Um, uh, how would you say, the, the new order was going to be made up of a white society, a white elitist society. And it would be based on the old mysticism and religion and philosophy of Africa, but it would be a new Africa or a new Egypt. So you're saying that new societies go all the way back into the Great Pyramid? Oh, yes, go all the way back, right. As a matter of fact, if you remember, the, the pyramids are made out of bricks. And those who work in the ancient world what bricks were called stone masons. And that's, of course, where we get today, the Masonic societies or the masons who work with bricks so that um, almost all Freemasons realize that their fraternity of Freemasonry goes all the way back into the ancient world, into the first dynasties of Egypt, and all of their symbolism comes from, from Egypt. But what's important is to understand that today... In order to understand, when the president says the new world order, and you hear this term quite often now, let me explain to you what's being said when you hear the words new world order. America is referred to as the new world. Christopher Columbus yes. discovers the new world. Well, the old world is Europe. And, it, and for almost 2,000 years, Europe has controlled the world. Europe has dominated the world. 
and Rome has dominated Europe. So for almost 2,000 years, Rome, or the Roman Church, the Roman authority of Europe, uh, through their ancient houses, their, their fraternal houses, have controlled Europe, and Europe has dominated the world. Now, did the Crusades have anything to do Absolutely. with that? Absolutely. That's exactly right. That's why Steven Spielberg and the George Lucas movies with uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Okay. Of course, you can't understand the Last Crusade if you don't understand the first one. And it has to do with the Lost Ark, and that's why Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Ark of Covenant. And now, incidentally, in that Lo Raiders of the Lost Ark, where were they looking for the Lost Ark? In Jerusalem? Yeah. In Palestine? In the Holy City? No, in Egypt. They were looking for the lost ark in Egypt because that's exactly where the ark originally was, in Egypt. It was an African symbol. It was purely an African symbol, the ark. And later on, it was brought into modern use in, uh, in the Bible. It was referred to as the ark of the covenant. But actually, it comes from Egypt. It's a much older symbol. Mm -hmm. But anyway, if you think about the power base in Europe being the old world, Europe being the old world, and those powers that are behind the throne of Europe dominating the world, that was an order like the Masonic order or an order of priesthood, you know, the orders of, uh, you know, the fraternal orders. Now, as I reflect on history, several United States uh, presidents belong to the Masonic... Quite a few. As a matter of fact, uh, the founders of the United States, um, the uh, founders of the country, the signers of the Constitution, were all Freemasons, except for the few that were Rosicrucians, and there were a few others that were of other fraternal orders. Uh, in that respect, it's interesting to do a little research in your, in your history books on an order called the Puri de Sion, the Holy House of Sion, S-I-O-N, not Z-I-O-N, mm -hmm. Puri de Sion. It's a very powerful secret society that's even in existence in uh, the south of France today, and that's why, of course, uh, South of France has always been a very mystical place for occult societies, uh, the Cathars, of course, and the Albigensian Crusades. Um, but let me get back to this point about Rome dominating Europe and Europe dominating the world. Rome, or the Roman Church today, was the power of Europe, and that was the old world order, the order of the old world. But with the coming of America, we have a new world order. And therefore, it is the power, elite power base, which is America, the new order. Are you saying that, that power was passed on to That's America? That's right. The power was passed on to did America. Did they seize it and take it? Were well, they, they, actually, they actually, in fact, seized it and took it and, and moved the power base from Europe to America. And therefore, the order that now is directing affairs behind the scenes in America is, is referred to by people on the inside as the new order, the new world order, because America is, as I said, the new world. And so when we understand what the symbolism on the dollar bill, and it's just an enormous subject, getting into the motion pictures, Hollywood, is immense. incidentally, the magic practicing priest of the old Celtics priest, the old Babylonian uh, Celtic priest of, uh, of Europe, had magic wands. And the magic wands were always made out of holly wood. <laughs> and that's why, because they would work their magic in holly, with holly wood. And, of course, the secret societies are still today working their magic with we, holly wood. We, we use this terminology, uh, secret societies. Are they really secret? Well, they, they you see, that not all of them are secret. Many are semi-secret societies. Uh, in the 35 years that I've been interested in this subject, I find that there is always going to be many people who have come out of societies for whatever purpose and for whatever reason and begin to divulge some of the materials and some of the things that were going on behind the scenes. Usually we hear about this like 50 to 60 to 100 years later. Someone we finally find out yeah. wrote a book or something, and then we look back and then we can see why things happened the way they did. But today our world is totally in the grips of secret societies. The Middle East is, is dominated by some very powerful secret societies that work on um, fraternal orders. That's the reason why George Bush had the, uh, the troops in the Middle East. 
It was to show power to other secret societies, so to speak, who is actually in control of the Middle East. I want to ask this question for a viewer that may be out there wondering, uh, what about the Republican and Democratic Party? Uh, well, uh, George Washington, uh, I didn't write this, I'm just relating it to you. George Washington mentioned uh, in one of his letters, uh, actually two letters, to a reverend uh, in 1794, something like that, that, um, the, that there was a secret society operating in Washington at the time, and he referred to it as the Democratic Societies which was later to become you known as the Democratic Party. And he said that this society of the Democratic Society of Democratic Party was absolutely a very, um, uh, what was his word, subversive movement within the Republic. And it had as its motive, it has as its motive, the dividing of the people from their government. To divide the people from their government so that you would send your, your, your elected leaders, your democratically elected leaders to Washington, not realizing that those elected leaders would be members of secret societies and fraternal orders, which would be working in, 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 uh, in concert with the secret societies in Washington. And you have to understand that Washington, D.C. is a very powerful spot in the world for secret activities. All right, well, I throw, I throw on a name like Ross Perot. Yeah, well, Ross Perot, I mean, they you know, He's even a newcomer. I, I, I go back into uh, Woodrow Wilson's day, Woodrow Wilson's connections with occult orders and uh, the occult symbols on the dollar bill. Uh, there's an interesting point about the dollar bill on the right-hand side with the eagle. Of course, the eagle is the old phoenix symbol of rising from the ashes of destruction, for coming for the, uh, from the old Roman symbols which even goes back even further than that. But uh, above the eagle on the right-hand side of the dollar bill, you'll see 13 stars just above the eagle's head. 13 stars, and there are 13 cloudbursts around the 13 stars. There are 13 feathers in the wings. Mm -hmm. There are 13 stripes in the shield. On one side, there are 13 arrows. The other side, uh, at the bottom, there are 13 leaves and 13 berries in the leaves. The pyramid on the left-hand side has 13 layers. Now, what are the berries symbolic? Well, it's just the, the, the most important thing is the 13. Why is 13 so uh, dominating the, the dollar bill? Because 13 is a very powerful, mystical number to secret societies because, uh, incidentally, uh, our 13 colonies, the original colonies, were uh, the reason why we didn't have uh, 42 colonies. Why didn't we have 10 colonies or 127 colonies? Why well, do we have 13? Now, some viewer out there might say, well, 13 is an unlucky number. That's right. 13 is an unlucky number for you. That's the point. 13 is unlucky for you to use because it's a holy number. The 13 is based on Jesus and his 12. Jesus and his 12 make the 13. The 12 uh, followers of Jesus were called in the Bible the uh, cornerstones of the of the new world order the cornerstones jesus is twice referred to in the new testament as the um chief cornerstone the builders rejected the chief cornerstone mm -hmm. the word chief cornerstone in the bible is a greek word means the peak of a pyramid that's what it means the so they're the top of a pyramid therefore that peak of a pyramid is a chief cornerstone and according to the old occultic uh, understanding of the old Kabbalistic understanding of the Bible that that pyramid at the top with the eye, the eye is of course Jesus. The eye goes back to of course Horus which was the sun in the uh, ancient Egyptian and of course today we have that eye on the dollar bill representing Jesus or God's son. Now do you know the person that designed uh, the artist? Maybe? Yes, the artist that designed, uh, I'm not sure exactly who designed it originally, but that symbol on the dollar bill on the left-hand side with the pyramid has been in existence just as it is today, was in existence in 1774 in Bavaria, south of Germany, in Bavaria, there was an organization, a secret society, a fraternal order uh, called the Illuminati. They used that exact identical symbol. You can still see it in the European uh, mar uh, libraries and museums. Uh, the question is, wh how does it end up on, on an American dollar bill? That's right. the question. Right. If it was an old German secret society, 
Well, and that gets into uh, some of the fraternal orders that are behind the throne in America. Uh, there's, there's such a vast subject. Uh, Which leads me up to a question, not to uh, cut you off, but what is the impact of secret societies on American politics today? It, it absolutely is the heart, the blood, and the brains behind America today of secret societies. The Republican Party is one hand, the Democratic Party is another, and the brain is the secret societies behind the scenes. Very powerful, intelligent um, people are at work behind the scenes governing both the Democratic and the Republican Party. Now, who's, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, uh, so in fact, in point of fact, it doesn't matter who is made president. Uh, the power uh, is always going to be in the hands of the people behind the scenes. That's why in America we have a right to elect. We love to talk about our right to elect, but we don't have a right to select. That is decided upon by those who are in power, like today, the Democratic uh, Clinton and uh, the, the Democratic candidate uh, Clinton is a member of the, uh, is, is a very uh, well-educated man. He is a Rhodes, Rhodes Scholar. Yes. And if you understand what the Rhodes Scholarship comes from Cecil Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes of South Africa. And Cecil Rhodes said that he was going to leave his millions and millions of dollars to set up a secret society that would be uh, teaching young white people, young white men, to be able to come into power and handle the power of a very vast new world government in which the, you know, and so uh, that was the dream of Cecil Rhodes to be able to, uh, to create a secret society that could dominate the world from behind the scenes and do it with such expertise that no one should ever even get the knowledge of it. No, it seems like the winds of change. You hear that statement quite frequently when it comes to politics and, and people uprising to change governments. Does secret society have any impact with the situation that's going on in Europe? Absolutely. Has secret societies have, have to do with everything that's going on in the entire world? You, you, can, you, you have to know that where there is politics, there is money. Where there's money in politics, there's religion. And there are powerful forces at work uh, right now in Yugoslavia. There are books written 20 years ago. Uh, talking about how the secret societies in the 90s, the early 90s, were going to break up Yugoslavia. And they had already designed how they were going to do it, who they were going to, uh, you know, start the war with, and how they were going to start it. Twenty years ago, books were written about Yugoslavia. That's just one example. And if you, uh, in that type of research, you can pretty well tell what's coming down the line. You can already tell the... Uh, uh, who's going to be doing what, if you understand the story. As, as I said, if you can read the symbols. Now, a question for viewers out there. You're not just predicting doom. What can the American people do, or people that's, that want to change? What can they do to expose these societies? Well, let me say this. I am directing my words, my work, what I do. I am directing my, my comments and my work only to a select people, only to select few, and that is those who really care about their lives, those who really care about the country they live in, those who really care about freedom, liberty, and I believe that the most important thing one can do is to educate your mind first, because that's where real freedom is, is in the intellect, spiritual and intellectual freedom, and without that kind of freedom, uh, things you don't understand, things you don't know, uh, being not, ab not being able to read symbols, that's where they have you. So because you don't understand the yeah. game that's being we're played. We're in a world surrounded with symbols and images, right. and so one needs to take the time to explore right. the history of these and see what they really mean. It's got to. Uh, now, a question. You're a very noted lecturer. You will be doing some events sometime? Yes. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be uh, doing some radio programs. I already have. I was in ABC New York. I did a two-hour show there, and that was uh, very exciting. Uh, I just we just did a, a, a program for CBS. I was on CBS special on uh, ancient mysteries of the Bible. I'm doing a, 
a program for NBC, probably, uh, hopefully, that's in the works. Right. Uh, and also, I've, I've just uh, done some radio programs here in Los Angeles. And you're also going to do a uh, book tour, a lecture yes, tour, right. to the various independent bookstores throughout Southern California. Right. Right, exactly. That's sometime this month. As a matter, as a matter of fact, yes. And, uh, and the Black and Latino Multicultural Bookstore, uh, I'm going to be uh, giving a lecture there also. And that's for the uh, general public? Yes, for the general public. And, uh, and uh, there's, there's just an enormous amount of material. A lot of people might think that this is the kind of a subject that you'd have to be in government or behind the scenes. You'd be surprised how much material is actually out there if you just know where it is. Well, this is the information age, just dubbed yes, that. that's right. We're living in the information capital of the world. Right. I should say most of the information that you probably acquired, you got right here in the United States. Oh, sure, absolutely. It's interesting, too, that your, your listeners might in, be interested to know why our country is ruled from um, the District of Columbia and why we have uh, Columbia Broadcasting System in Columbia University and, um, uh, and the Space Shuttle is Columbia. And, of course, the Columbia Broadcasting, CBS, Columbia Broadcasting Television, has the symbol of the all-seeing eye, the eye on the dollar bill. Um, the United States is ruled from the White House, not Black House or Brown House, but from the White House. And England is, of course, ruled from the White Hall, which is like the Masonic Hall, the Lodge Hall, or England's government it comes from White Hall. America is from the White House. So there are symbols and emblems, and they mean something. And uh, I might also interject this. This, is, this I consider to be very important. When the new king of England is crowned, Prince Charles is made king, listen to the words that the Archbishop of Canterbury will say to the new king in his initiation ceremony. He says that the king of England is taking this position of king for Jesus Christ and ruling for Jesus Christ ruling for Jehovah on God's throne and that that is why God's kingdom is represented by the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is God's kingdom. And of course Rome has a terrible dispute with that. Rome had a dispute with, uh, with England being the center for God's kingdom or the United Kingdom. The Pope felt that he was the vicar of Christ. And that was the basis for two world wars that we got involved in as to who and what secret society was going to be in dominating the world, the old world of Rome or the new world of Anglo-American. As you have seen, world politics is actually based on religion. And a very good place to begin your research would be the history of the Christian religion to the year 200, 556 page hardback in limited supply and a most exciting book called symbols sex in the stars this is one of my most favorite books it's 396 page uh, book on all of the hidden occult or hidden symbolism on sex astrological astro theology uh, the Kabbalistic sciences, all of the ancient and strange things in religion that just most people are not aware of. This is a 396-page blockbuster book. It's been reprinted by uh, the Book Tree, and I highly recommend it. And also, I am producing a new uh, video based on this book. This book is so sensational, I'm basing my new video. Uh, on this book, Symbols, Sex, and the Stars. You don't want to miss this one.